I'm Eric Grimberger. I'm a lecturer at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem um, and, and, and a co-chair of the Scientific Committee of the Academic Track. And we're going to hear uh, our next talk from uh, Benjamin, um, who is uh, um, just finishing uh, his, his undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto. Uh, where he studied mathematics and international relations. And he'll soon be moving to EPFL, which stands for the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne, which is a university in Lausanne, Switzerland, a good one. Um, to study digital humanities, uh, Venemin has an interest in applying computational methods to geographic data. And that's what we're going to hear about right now when he'll talk about uh, an automated approach to identifying corporate editing activity in OpenStreetMap, so uh, a topic we've already heard about today. And those of you following the, the track from the morning and from the last session uh, you must already see some uh, familiar faces on, on the slide. Uh, so uh, anyway, good luck, and uh, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Benjamin. This is actually my first state of the map, and I'm relatively new to the OpenStreetMap community, having been working on it for the last almost a year now. So I'm really grateful for Dipto Sakar, Jennings Anderson, and Robert Soden for kind of showing me the ways and guiding this research. And um, this research would not be here without them. Today, I'm going to be presenting uh, our work on uh, titled An Automated Approach to Identifying Corporate Editing Activity in OpenStreetMap. The goal of this research is basically to create a model that can predict the likelihood that a mapper is corporate or not based on their change set history. And this was really given the, um, based on the observation that corporate signatures are pretty distinct and pretty unique. And so uh, if we're able to extract some differences between corporate and volunteer mappers, then we can probably teach a computer to do the same thing. I'm going to start off this presentation by going over some of the related literature and traditional approaches to identifying corporate mapping on OpenStreetMap. Then I'll get into some of the feature engineering that we did from the change set data. Then I'll talk briefly about the model and the validation that we're currently going through. And finally, I'll share some fun summary statistics on the current situation of corporate mapping in OpenStreetMap based off what our model predicted. So studying mappers on OpenStreetMap isn't new. And there's two works that I want to highlight here, though I should really have added another one from the last presentation, because I think the last presentation is another fantastic example of this, of studying who maps on OpenStreetMap. So the first article, there's two articles I want to highlight here. The first one is by Jennings Anderson and Dipto Sakar from 2019, where they presented some summary statistics from 10 corporate accounts, corporate mapping teams, and some beautiful plots associated with it. This really motivated the work that we're currently doing because they found that corporations have a very distinct editing pattern in OpenStreetMap. There's another study that I want to highlight here, which examined um, quality assessment in Mozambique, and they also used they use an unsupervised approach there. So they develop many contributor features, which we build off of and use in some of our analyses as well. So to begin, I want to talk about how do we actually extract corporate mappers on OpenStreetMap. Well, the main way is going through the organized editing activities um, lists through the link here. And so the community guidelines state that each corporation, each organized editor needs to create an OSM wiki page where they disclose some of the mappers that map for them. There's a couple issues with this approach that we had when we were trying to get the mapping list initially. First of all, we're not entirely sure how updated these lists are. Sometimes um, new instances of mappers appear who map for corporations, but they aren't like in real time updated to the OSM wiki page. Um, also, they have different ways of actually presenting the data. So some present the OpenStreetMap, their corporate mappers in GitHub, others use the OSM wiki. And so as the number of corporations grows in OpenStreetMap, it becomes more and more difficult to really scale this method of extracting the list this way. So to 
Another approach which we tried initially was clustering user profiles. So as we know, every single OSM member has a user profile. Sometimes they're blank, other times they have information about themselves. And so what we did is we vector, we scraped 121,000 user profiles for every single user with 50 or more change sets. And we then vectorized all these user bios and we found that if we cluster on them, a lot of interesting groups appear. So for example, the Amazon cluster right here is very, very big because almost verbatim, most of the mappers have um, a very similar profile, which begins with, I work for Amazon Logistics. At Amazon Logistics, we utilizing OSM um, for the delivery pro programs. We also found a similar cluster for Grab. But what's interesting about this clustering approach is also able to reveal clusters that we might not normally associate with users like students. Another cluster I remember was Garmin editors. However, this method also sometimes conflated different um, corporate users with um, um, other groups. So what we ended up doing for our corporate mappers data set was just doing a regular expression search through the profiles to find instances of specific company names that we extracted from the OSM organized editing activities page. And we found 3,424 corporate mappers on OpenStreetMap. So now that we have this data set of known corporate mappers on o OSM, we want to compare how these known corporate mappers differ from volunteer mappers on the platform. So this required us working with the change set data. There's a great diary post by, I believe by Jennings actually, which introduces this um, change set data set, which is available publicly on AWS, which is free to access. All you need to do is access the Amazon Web Services. So we chose all mappers with more than 50 unique change sets. Um, so we downloaded every single edit that these mappers did. And this left us with 121,000 unique mappers since 2015. Um, and now the question became, how do the two groups differ? How do the volunteer mappers differ from the corporate mappers? And this required feature engineering. The first feature that we really wanted to focus on was time series. Um, and it came from the observation that corporations tend to map nine to five and on weekdays, whereas regular users tend to map uh, more haphazardly or with less underlying signal that we can really extract. So this is an example of the Apple editing team, how they map. And this is just sampled volunteers. And um, here I'm using, I'm, I'm calling volunteers all mappers who are not corporate, even though this distinction should, doesn't necessarily hold because there's still organized mappers there. But just for the sake of the presentation, we'll call them volunteers. Um, and we find that indeed there is some signal to, uh, like Apple tends to map more on the weekdays and nine to five, whereas on the week, whereas the volunteer mappers don't. Um, so, but the one problem that arose is related with time zones is that all change sets are normalized to UTC time. So if we have two mappers, let's imagine we have one mapper in Toronto and another mapper in Beijing, and they perform an edit at the same time, it would appear that OSM would automatically normalize the data to UTC time when in fact they're editing in completely different time periods. So we also can't use the location of the edits to find out the local time zone just because as we all know, there's remote mapping. So the question became, can we uncover the local time zone of a user based on their editing history? And this is just an example of six corporate teams and the mapping signature of the users. So like here in Facebook, we clearly see two patterns. So um, which are both transposed by several hours. So like some users map this way, Monday through Friday, other users map transpose this way. Apple has a lot of users and it's difficult to see if there is some signal there. So the way that we went about doing this is actually defining a corporate time signature. So um, using the corporate accounts that we saw, we looked at them and quantitatively defined a corporate signature that represented corporate mappers on the platform. Then what we did is we conducted a linear translation for all users to try to minimize the distance between the corporate signature and the actual user's mapping habit. So like if we imagine this blue line is the, uh, the corporate signature that we defined, then this is an unadjusted corporate user. Then what we do is we adjust the time zones to have them fit onto our proposed corporate signature. And this method worked really, really well 
at actually um, localizing the users. So um, for example, here was the Apple users before. After we adjusted using this method, we were able to find really that the nine to five schedule held for Apple users. Here's the Facebook user. We were also able to adjust back to the method. And so this gave us a feature in the space, which is how close is a user's time signature to, um, to the corporate time signature. Um, and what we found surprisingly is the top 100 most similar um, you, mo the top 100 most similar users to, sorry, with the smallest time score were actually all corporate users, all no known corporate users. The next feature that we developed was geographic dispersion. And this came from a different observation that corporate mappers tend to app map more dispersed than volunteer mappers. And at first this observation was entirely qualitative. It intuitively felt right to us that this should be true, but we wanted to robustly show this. And here I have an anecdotal example where I sampled one random corporate user and one random volunteer user. And the only condition was that they had approximately the equal number of edits to the map. And as we can see, um, there is more dispersion, but how do we rigorously quantify this? So what we did is we ended up creating a geographic score, which um, I'm happy to get into later on how we actually created it, but basically what we did is we projected every single edit onto the sphere, and then we took the average of the edits. So the closer it is to the center of the sphere, the more dispersed it is. And this is one method we were able to read about. And so what we find is that corporate mappers tend to map far more dispersed than volunteer mappers. Um, so here is like as the score, as it gets really dispersed, most of the corporate mappers tend to be there. And this non-corporate cluster group tends to just, and the tail goes on for a long time, so they map less dispersed. The final set of features that we focused on were what users edit and some other metadata associated with that. So the comment data is really rich with description of what users edit. So we focused on three features, building, services, and roads. Um, we find that corporations tend to edit more built more roads and services, whereas non-corporate users tend to focus more on buildings and some roads. Then uh, um, we also looked at some metadata like the source of the edit and the um, and the editor that they use for the edits. And then after what we had is just one big feature space that included all these features. And now with these features, we wanted to define a model that could hopefully let us predict if a user is corporate or volunteer. And the first problem that arose is that the data set's really quite unbalanced. So we have 3,200, 3,400 corporate mappers, and we have 118,000 non-corporate mappers. So any good um, model would just automatically predict that everybody's volunteer and have a very high accuracy score. So what we had to do is actually upsample the corporate mappers. And we did this by synthetically creating more corporate users using a method called SMOTE. We tried several models on these features and here's actually feature importance. So the geographic score and the time series score, the two features that we engineered were the key signals for these models. Um, all the models provided comparable recall, which means that they were all able to e extract the known corporate mappers, but the precision really differed. Um, the neural model that we used provided the best results with 99% recall and 79% precision, but it still did predict almost a thousand more corporate mappers. And uh, this was kind of worrisome for us because uh, um, who are these thousand corporate mappers? Is our model just predicting a lot of volunteer mappers? And so now we're currently entering the stage of validating the model. Um, so all the models predicted more, more corporate mappers than there actually were. And so who are these actual mappers? And this required validation. So what I did is I went through 500 of the false positives to see who they are um, and manually went through their editing history their bios, uh, the tags that they use. And we find that mostly these additional mappers come from organized editors from organizations like HOT. Some of them were volunteer who had editing signatures that really matched corporate mappers. And um, for other users, it was really quite difficult to tell if they were corporate or volunteer, 
either it was that the um, uh, either it was that the change sets were really not a lot was written there, or they don't really disclose anything. So for these users, we tend to lean more towards the volunteer side, though they could have been. Um, some corporate mappers. It would be interesting to actually connect this approach with the previous presentation to see if we could uncover some communities with these other users. And then there were some other corporate mappers that this predicted, which our scrape did not pick up on. And that was around 20% um, of the 500 false positives were additional corporate users. So now that we have this model and this predicted set of corporate mappers, what does this mean for the OSM community? Well, here I'm gonna present quickly some summary statistics and some data that we were able to generate. The first one is growth in corporate editing on OSM from 2015 to 2021 based off our um, data set. So what we find is that actually there's a real big spike in 2018 in corporate mappers. This is the proportion of edits that are corporate given over a month. And actually in 2020, it almost approaches 25% of edits done by the end of 2019 were done by corporate mappers. This is another plot similar to one of Jennings from one of his diary posts that shows how different countries have different corporate editing. And actually I think it's even more represented in this plot where we show the geographic change in corporate mapping on OSM. Um, Right, so uh, this is, uh, sorry, yeah, so this is uh, our work today. Um, uh, we basically developed some new features to uh, compare corporate mappers from volunteer mappers. Then we developed a model to predict some more mappers. There are some limitations to our current approach. First of all, a lot of organized mappers, which we consider not pay to have signatures that are similar to corporate mappers and we really want to account for that. A second um, concern is that, um, sorry, I'm trying to, is we want to develop, increase the number of features that we use to really increase the precision. And so at the beginning, I pointed out that article using an unsupervised approach in Mozambique, and they have a list of 10 additional features that we hope to add to our current method. And we're currently in the process of just validating this approach and trying to make it more robust. Um, let me just see. Right. So uh, that's all for my presentation today. Thank you guys so much for listening. Hopefully I didn't cut out or anything. Um, but yeah, that's all. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for very interesting and um, easy to follow talk. You didn't cut out at all. Um, so uh, we already have a few questions here on the questions tab. Everyone are welcome to continue post questions also on, on the chat if, if that's uh, that's more fitting to you. Uh, so the first question, I think it relates to the clustering results you have shown at the beginning of your uh, presentation. And it says that uh, it seems that the results did not detect uh, a cluster of Apple mappers, um, which or we have, have their usual uh, intro with Apple. Is there a reason for why you, oh. you missed it? Actually, we had two Apple clusters. For this, I only annotated a few examples just to show um, what the clustering could do on the profiles. But there were two Apple clusters. One is active Apple mappers, and the other one is former Apple mappers. So when we did the clustering, I didn't really focus on it too much just because we didn't end up using this approach. But what we did is we did silhouette scoring on the number of clusters. And we found, I think, 50 clusters was the optimal amount. And this 50 clusters gave two distinct clusters of Apple mappers. However, the issue became that sometimes Apple mappers would mention that they're Apple mappers. But then other times they would mention that they're Apple mappers and a lot of other information which could confuse the model. And so it wouldn't only cluster them in the Apple category, but actually put them in a different category. And so we ended up just using the simple regular expression search just because it was um, more um, accurate. Okay, so uh, um, so uh, your results were better than the you you, you discussed. Um, so it was a good question. Um, so um, another question is about the geo score calculation. Uh, could you tell us a bit more? bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so 
the way that I understand it, when I was researching the way to quantify this dispersion, um, let me actually see. I think I have a slide for how it was calculated. Um, sorry, just give me one second. Um, so the goal of the geographic score is to just measure the dispersion of a user, the editing habit, and um, you're actually, um, I guess I'll just have to explain it. But basically the idea is that we project all the edits onto the earth. And then, so like we have two edits here, which represent two vectors. And then if we take the mean of those two vectors, it'll give us something here. And then the distance from the origin of the earth will become smaller. So if they edit widely around the earth, then it will steadily ap approach zero, the average of the vectors. But if they edit only in one area selectively, then the average of the vectors will be right here. So what we're me measuring really is the distance from the origin to um, to the average of the vectors. And so this gave us, it was one of the better methods that I found of measuring this geographic dispersion, but um, we're currently in the process of experimenting. So if anybody else has any better ideas of how to measure the geometric dispersion, I'm happy to hear them. I think uh, sounds like a good approach and a uh, um, very clear explanation. Thank you for that. Um, another question is um, whether there are special cases of corporate editors which were hard to detect. For example, corporate editors working part time. And I would add to that another question that came to my mind is. Um, it's possible that the working habits of, of, of many people nowadays are changing and, and may change for good with COVID and everything. And working hours be would become more flexible with uh, working from home becoming more uh, uh, frequent. So do you think your model would be able to adjust for this reality? Yeah, so that those are both two um, really great questions. To answer the first one, um, was about um, working part-time or corporate mappers that are hard to predict. Yeah, so we did analyze the 40 or 50 users who are known corporate mappers, but were not predicted corporate mappers. And unfortunately, we didn't contact them. So I, I don't entirely know if they're working part-time or what the situation is, but there are these users, um, they do exist. And it's actually in our pipeline down the line to like really analyze the users that we did misclassify as volunteer instead of being corporate. Um, it's one thing that we, we've talked a lot about how well this method can scale down the line. And if like corporations start editing different objects, if they develop different editing habits, COVID, as we all saw have with remote work, it's a lot of it's been changing. And so it really, I, I'm not super confident about how well this will scale in that sense. But um, I think the one thing about the time series score is if we can define a few corporate signatures and use a few different corporate signatures that can, one of them mess, is like a part-time schedule, another one is a different type of schedule, then we can potentially um, overcome some of those barriers that way. But yeah, if tomorrow all the corporate mappers decide to map entirely differently, entirely different objects, entirely different time series patterns, then um, this method won't hold. So it does require at least a little bit of consistency, which is inherent to a lot of machine learning models that predict in the future. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, simple question, will you publish your approach for the OSM community to replicate? Yeah, so actually the GitHub page is almost ready. Um, we're sharing all the data that we used, all the code that we used, and uh, as soon as it's ready, I think we will either share it on Twitter or something. But um, yeah, so we, we do plan to share everything. And as for the paper, the paper is also a work in progress right now. I just really want to make sure the validation is correct, just because the 1,000 additional users that were predicted was quite worrisome, and I want to make sure that we understand who these users are. Okay, um, yeah, and, and, and once uh, everything would be ready, there are plenty of ways to share, including the OSM science mailing list. It's a good place. Well, Jennings knows all the places even better than I do, so um, we'll be looking forward to that. Um, is it possible to detect unhealthy community mapper behaviors? 
like mapping 12 hours a day so the smart API can protect against unhealthy addictions? Uh, it's, it's an important question, actually. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, and I haven't really thought about it. Um, so I'm not sure um, how to answer it. But yes, the, the idea is quite simple. So if you define any, um, any schedule that you want to try to mimic, then we can, in theory, calculate how similar a corporate user, any user's editing signature is that time series score. And so if you wanted to see if somebody edits 12 hours a day, every day of the week, then yes, that's that's very possible. Um, and probably I agree with you that it is quite unhealthy addiction. <laughs> um, yeah, well, at least it produces something useful, hopefully. Uh, so uh, just kind of, uh, it, it's a positive kind of uh, addiction, at least in, the term, in terms of uh, outputs. Um, I see no more questions, so I'll move on, on to mine. Um, so, so if I got it correctly, um, the identification of, of, of corporate makers was based only on the temporal signature? On the temporal Sorry, signature. what's your question? Um, was the um, identification process defined only according to the um, temporal score? Or also oh choose. no! So we used we. I think we in the end had approximately nine features. Five of them were simply metadata from the OSM change sets. What kind of editor did they use? The kind of objects that they edit, and then it, the other one was the ge geometric dispersion score. Um, other ones included biographical data. When did they start mapping? How consistently do they map over the week? Um, do they map in one period, then no mapping, then another period? And then the last one was the time series score. But I really wanted to focus on the geometric and the time series score just because these are two novel metrics that we developed in our research here. Um, and can you tell me in, in what ways do the hot uh, mappers were similar to corporate editors? Yeah, so, so the main method is actually like, I believe it's hot Indonesia or something. And I tried reading about it and I spoke with Jennings about it. And a lot of the, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can say it, but I think there are some instances of mappers who work for organizations who are paid mappers. And so paid mappers are distinct from organized mappers because, for example, a paid mapper work, sorry, distinct from a corporate mapper because a paid mapper can work for a city. Cities are another instance of mappers who are characterized as corporate when, in fact, they weren't corporate. And so we really do have to be careful about the way that we go through the definitions and actually, the way that I started this project was going through the mailing lists and Professor Robert Soden tasked me with reading through every single mention of organizing and corporate editing just to get an understanding of what the corp, what the OSM community is like. So I had this long, bio, this long timeline of every single instance of organized and corporate editing mentioned within the community. And it is a very hot button issue. And I know that definitions are important for the OSM community or like the way that we categorize everything. So you have to forgive me for using this simple dichotomy of volunteer and corporate, but in reality, it is far more nuanced than that. Okay. Um, yeah, Jennings endorses your, your uh, response, your answer, which I agree is great. So it's a good response. Um, one more question that I thought of. Is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot of um, but in in terms of, of of essence and content corporate editors bring into the project and i think one of the hot questions is how whether and how do they change the project or the, the map uh, and you mentioned that corporate editors tend to uh, map to focus their mapping on specific entities um do you think you even intuitively, that they bring another perspective into the project, uh, according to your results, another kind of a uh, way of, of, of thinking about the world when mapping? Yeah, so I, I really think that I, the best answer for this question would be to defer to Dipto or Jennings, just because they understand this um, uh, far better than I do. But to attempt to answer it a little bit differently, one idea that I have is the comment data 
approach that I use for the comment data right now is really quite limited where I'm currently searching for buildings, services, and roads. But in reality, we can increase this significantly. So some things that I've been trying playing around with was running word embeddings and different forms of vectorizing the actual comment data and then uncovering like latent relationships between what users edit, who edits, what kind of objects, because it's so rich. Like they could be a, a, editing a, a trail, a creek, a road, a path, and the list of just terminology of what users are editing goes on for a, a long time. And so I really think that if we can take in far more of this data of what users are editing, then we can improve the results dramatically. Okay. Um. Interesting. Um, just as an anecdote, uh, the, the two papers that you mentioned in the beginning of the of, of your talk were uh, presented at the 2020 and 2019 academic track editions. So uh, it, it's nice to see uh, that the work presented earlier uh, uh, gives inspiration to future work. Uh, um, and uh, I think that would continue with such good talk. Um, yeah. Um, uh, the summary statistics that you've shown uh, um, was that after removing false uh, uh, positives and so on. So what we did for the summary statistics is we removed all mappers who have used the, the hot hashtag, hot OSM hashtag, more than I think in ten percent of their edits. So we tried to remove any organized mappers. Then we just assumed that the additional mappers that were predicted were corporate mappers. Um, and to get a lay of the land and see what this model looks like. And that assumption isn't entirely false just because we found within the additional 500 like manually annotated use mappers, a lot of them were corporate that the initial scrape did not pick up on. And so this once again relates to the problem of actually aggregating a list of real corporate mappers on OpenStreetMap. And so we used the predicted corporate mappers alongside the known corporate mappers to develop those summary statistics. OK, thanks. Um, I think if, if, if no more questions, um, of course, if, if anyone wants to uh, directly ask when you mean questions and uh, uh, interact or discuss future collaborations, um, they're welcome to breakout room two, uh, which when you would uh, move uh, shortly. Um, yeah, and I think uh, that's it for, for me uh, for this session. And thank you. And please join us for the last talk of the day, uh, which would be uh, in. Uh, about 12 minutes um, about uh, the involvement of OpenStreetMap in uh, European Horizon 2020 project. So once again, thank you, thank you very much for an excellent talk and a very interesting one. And um, we can continue and back up from the two. Thank you.